This is the opening of Muhammad al-Ghazali's work, Deliverance from Error and Mystical Union with the Almighty. Muhammad al-Ghazali was an important Islamic philosopher and theologian in what we now call the 11th century AD and what Muslims of the time called the 5th century after the Hejra, when Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina. Al-Ghazali was a very studious and intellectually curious young man, and by the age of 36, he had become a professor at the University of Baghdad and was an important advisor to the Sultan. However, he had become dissatisfied with what he was doing in his life and had begun studying the ancient Greek philosophers in secret to see if they had a better understanding of the world than the Islamic theologians that he had been mainly interacting with. He went into a great depression and eventually gave up his job and left Baghdad to travel the Islamic world, studying with theologians, scholars, philosophers, mystics, and many others to see if any of them could answer his depression. Eventually, after 15 years of travel and seclusion, during which he wrote several books, but didn't teach any students, he was eventually called back to the university at Nishapur and began teaching again. This book, The Deliverance from Error, was written later in his life to explain his epistemological journey. Some of the ideas he gives seem very congenial to the modern era. He tells people to question their religious traditions. He says that a scholar shouldn't reject an idea just because it comes from a bad source. Just as a counterfeiter might have some real gold in his purse that you should accept, a heretic or heathen might have some real truth that they know that you should also accept. And the important thing is to develop the skills to tell these apart rather than re just reject ideas based on where they came from. But on the other hand, some of his ideas are less congenial to the modern era. He says that both our senses and our reasoning are uncertain and they shouldn't be trusted. And the only thing he thinks can give real knowledge is going to depend on mystical experience and religious revelation. He says that although scholars and theologians should investigate all sources, ordinary people should be banned from doing this, just as a snake charmer might know how to extract poisons and antidotes from the bodies of a snake, but shouldn't do so in front of a child in case the child thinks it's safe to touch the snake. Al-Ghazali's work eventually became central to the canon of Islamic philosophy and theology and shaped the development of this society in many ways including perhaps some of the turn away from the golden age of science and mathematics that had existed in Baghdad at the time he left. But his works were also extremely influential in the West, and they were read by both Christian and Jewish philosophers, both in Arabic and in Latin translation, and it shaped much of the later medieval philosophy, uh, including people like Thomas Aquinas, who had studied this work in university. Uh, and so now I'm going to go through the introduction and the first brief chapter of this book, where he outlines the arguments for his skepticism. Introduction. In the name of God, merciful benefactor, praise be to God, with such praise every message and address should begin, and blessed be Muhammad, his chosen prophet and messenger. Blessings be upon his kin and companions who have guided people away from error. My brother in faith, you have asked me to reveal to you the purpose and secrets of the sciences and the dangerous and complex depths of the various schools of thought. You would like me to tell you what I have undergone in order to distinguish the truth from error in the different sects, despite the differences in their paths and methods. You wish to know the daring it took to rise above the plane of conformism to the heights of observation and independent investigation. First, what profit I drew at the beginning from Kalam, Islamic theology. Secondly, how I then turned away from those who defended Talim, teaching, because they were impeded in reaching the truth by their subjection to an imam. Thirdly, how much I mistrusted the methods of philosophers. And finally, how I came to appreciate the way of Sufism. Here he's describing these four stages in his intellectual journey from a theologian who is teaching and studying at a university under religious authorities, then to his investigation of the ancient Greeks and the other philosophers, and eventually his time with the Islamic mystics, the Sufis. You would like to see the pulp of the truth as it appeared to me after I came back, came to doubt my efforts to analyze what different people said. And you would like to know what caused me to abandon my teaching in Baghdad, despite the great number of students there, and what made me take it up again a long time later in Nishapur. I promptly fulfilled your wishes, which I recognize as sincere, and counting on God to grant aid, confidence, success, and protection, I now plunge into my subject. You should know 
may God set you on the right path and lead you gently towards the truth, that people have different religions and beliefs, that there are different theological systems among religious leaders, and that the community of Islam has different sects and paths. All of this con constitutes a deep and dangerous sea in which most have foundered and only a few have survived. Yet each group believes it has found salvation. Each party rejoices at what it possesses. This was accomplished by what the master of prophets, peace be upon him, foretold sincerely and truthfully when he said, my nation will divide into 73 sects and only one of them will be saved. What he foretold has indeed almost come true. As for myself, since my early youth, when I reached puberty and before 20, up to the present time when I'm over 50, I've not ceased to delve into the depths of this deep ocean of the various beliefs of mankind, to plunge into its depths boldly, not as a cautious coward, to bury myself in obscure questions, eagerly seizing upon difficulties and leaping bravely into difficult and obscure issues, and to scrutinize the beliefs of each sect, examining from the doctrinal point of view the hidden aspects of every religious group. I do this in order to distinguish those who promote truth from those who advocate falsehood, and the faithful follower of the sunnah, the tradition, from the innovator. I do not leave an interiorist, one of these many sects, without attempting to discover his doctrine, or a literalist, another one of these sects, without seeking to know the essentials of his belief. I want to know the real thought of the philosopher, one of these people who studied the ancient Greeks in um, the Islamic world. I try to understand the purpose of the theologian's discussion and argumentation. I wish to penetrate the secrets of the mystics, the Sufis. I observe the devotee and what he gains from his severe devotion, as well as from the atheist or the nihilist materialist in order to discover the reasons for his bold attitude. From my youngest years in the prime of my life, my thirst to seize the profound reality of things was a natural instinct or tendency which God placed in me, not by my choice or conscious decision. As I approached adolescence while still young, the traditional bonds had already loosened and my inherited tendencies had broken down. I perceived that Christian children grew up as Christians, young Jews grew up in Judaism and young Muslims in Islam. I had heard the tradition that said that the prophet, peace be upon him, said, everyone is born with a sound nature. It's only your parents who make you a Jew or a Christian or a Magian, that is a Zoroastrian. So here he's giving us one of his first arguments that points out everyone's got mistakes. They're not all their fault. They're often the way that they're brought up. And we should question the way we're brought up in order to come to truer knowledge. An interior force drove me to research the reality of original human nature and that of the beliefs which derive from conformism to the authority of parents and teachers. I tried to discern among the elements which are taught by rote and accepted without question, which discrimination gives rise to so much controversy regarding what is true and what is false. So I said to myself, my aim is to perceive the deep reality of things. I wish to seize the essence of knowledge. Certain knowledge is that in which the thing known reveals itself without leaving any room for doubt or any possibility of error or illusion nor can the heart allow such a possibility. One must be protected from error and should be so bound to certainty that any attempt, for example, to transform a stone into gold or a stick into a serpent would not raise doubts or engender contrary possibilities. I know very well that 10 is more than three. If anyone tries to dissuade me by saying, no, three is more than 10, and wants to prove it by changing in front of me this stick into a serpent, even if I saw him changing it, Still, this fact would engender no doubt about my knowledge. Certainly, I would be astonished at such a power, but I would not doubt my knowledge. I think he's imagining here, imagine that someone came up to you and told you, you think the earth goes around the sun. You think there are electrons and atoms, but here I can prove to you that you're wrong. The sun actually goes around the earth and the matter is not made out of atoms, but out of this other substance. And I can prove it to you, look, Here's this machine I can make that allows me to levitate and fly and do all these other strange things. I think most of us, if someone claimed that to us, would in fact doubt our understanding the material world and would think this person knows what they're doing. And he's giving us some religious inspired example 
of the same thing. He's saying, you don't really know something unless you are so certain in it that even someone who can perform miracles couldn't get you to doubt your certainty. Thus, I came to know that whatever is known without this kind of certainty is doubtful knowledge, not reliable and safe, that all knowledge subject to error is not sure and certain. So I think here he's giving us this idea of just what a high degree of certainty he thinks is necessary for knowledge. And we could question whether that is what we are after, whether we think that is achievable, or whether we think this is putting things uh, beyond our reach. Chapter one, the way of sophistry and the denial of all knowledge. So here he's going to give his skepticism, his reason to doubt everything that we think we know. When I examined what I know, I found myself lacking this kind of certain knowledge, except as concerned things I could confirm with my own senses or necessary self-evident reason. So that is, he's saying, there's all sorts of other ways that I think I know things. I think I know things because someone told them to me. I think I know things because I got them from tradition or from my family. I think I know things because I just had some hunches or had some intuitions. And he says, when you see something with your own senses and when you perceive something through reason as necessary or self-evident, those seem to be closer to this while everything else is worse. So I said, now that despair has overcome me, there is no point in studying any problems except on the basis of what is self-evident, namely the affirmations of the senses and the necessary truths of reason. I had to look clearly at the nature of my trust in what I could confirm with my senses and my confidence in being safe from error by following the requirements of reason. Are these feelings similar to my previous trust in the opinions of authority and the feeling of most people regarding speculative knowledge? Or is it a question of a certainty without illusion or surprise? So here he's going to tell us, even the senses and reason are questionable. I proceeded therefore most earnestly to consider the evidence of my senses and the requirements of reason to see if I could make myself doubt these. This led me to lose faith in the evidence of my senses. This doubt, which became per completely pervasive, can be expressed as follows. How can one trust the evidence of one's senses? Sight is the most powerful of our senses. But we could stare at a shadow and judge that it is fixed and not moving at all. Yet at the end of an hour's watching, we find that the shadow has moved not all at once, but gradually or little by little. It's been moving all the time and never was in a state of rest. So this is one argument that sight deceives us. And since sight is the strongest sense, he thinks all our senses can deceive us. Second argument, the eye looks at a star and sees it reduced to the size of a coin. Whereas geometrical computations show that the star must be larger than the earth. This and similar cases exemplify how the evidence of one's senses leads one to a judgment, which reason shows irrefutably to be totally erroneous. So therefore he's saying, our senses lead us into falsehood, so we should doubt our senses. And now he's going to ask about reason. So thus I told myself that there is no security even in the evidence of one's senses. Perhaps such surety can be found only in intellectual truths which play the role of first principles of thought, such as 10 is greater than three. The same thing cannot simultaneously be affirmed and denied. Nothing here below can be both created and eternal, existent and non-existent, necessary and impossible. But the evidence of my senses replied, are you sure that when you trust the requirements of reason, it is not the same sort of trust that you had in the evidence of your senses. You trusted us, but the senses, but then reason accused us of being in error. Without that word of reason, you would trust us still. Perhaps there is something beyond reason which would show that reason in turn is an error, just as reason showed the error of the evidence of the senses. The fact that this further intelligence is not manifest does not prove that it is impossible. So here he's giving us an argument that perhaps reason can be doubted in the same way. Just as reason told us to doubt the senses, and we shouldn't be confident in the senses since this could have been coming, he says similarly, even though we don't yet have the thing that tells us to refute reason, perhaps there is one and so reason could be doubted too. 
again, you might consider whether you find that argument convincing or not. I remained for some little time speechless. Then the difficulty appeared to resemble the problem of sleep. I told myself that when one is asleep, one believes all sorts of things and finds oneself in all sorts of situations. One believes in them absolutely without the slightest doubt. When one wakes up, one re realizes the inconsistency and inanity of the phantasms of the imagination. In the same way, one might ask oneself about the reality of beliefs one has acquired through one's senses or by reason. Could one not imagine oneself in a state which compares to being awake just as wakefulness compares to being asleep? Being awake would be like the dreams of that state, which in turn would show that the illusion of the certainty of rational knowledge is nothing but vain imagination. Think about all the times that you've had a dream where you thought you worked something out, and then when you wake up, you realize that your reasoning in the dream was just totally mistaken. He's saying, perhaps such a state might be one that the mystics, the Sufis claim, for they assert, that when they become totally absorbed in themselves and completely abstract from their senses, they find themselves in a state of mind which does not agree with what is given by reason. Perhaps this further state is none other than death. Did not Allah's messenger, peace be upon him, say, men are asleep and in dying they awaken. Life here below may be a dream compared with life beyond. After death, things would appear in a different light. And as the Quran says, we have lifted your veil, and today your sight is penetrating. So he's giving here an argument that life may be just like a dream to reality, just as dreams are compared to life. And so if our reasoning and our senses are all products of this life, then perhaps they should be treated as no more certain than a dream. Then these thoughts came to my mind and gnawed at me. I tried to find some way of treating my unhealthy condition, but this was in vain. They could be dispelled only by reasoning, which is impossible without recourse to the first principles of knowledge. If these are not admissible, no construction of a proof is possible. That is, reason can't get you out of this situation in which you're doubting reason. My disease grew worse and lasted almost two months, during which I fell prey to skepticism, though neither in theory nor in outward expression. At last, God the Almighty cured me of that disease and I recovered my health and mental equilibrium. The self-evident principles of reason again seemed acceptable. I trusted them and in them felt safe and certain. I reached this point not by well-ordered or methodical argument, but by means of a light God the Almighty cast into my breast, which light is the key to most knowledge. So here's where he's saying, Reason is not the foundation of our knowledge, but rather this sort of mystical experience, this exposure to God that gives you the foundations of all the certainty. It, it gives you what you can then rely on to support reason and the senses in the cases where they're safe. Anyone who believes that the unveiling of truth is the fruit of well-ordered arguments belittles the immensity of divine mercy. God's messenger, peace be upon him, was asked about spiritual expansion and the sense in which this is found in the word of the God. Him who, when God wishes to direct, he opens his breast to Islam, he said. It is a light which God the Almighty throws upon the heart. When they asked him, how may we recognize it? He replied, by this, that a person turns away from every vanity to return to eternity. Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, God the Almighty created mankind in darkness and then scattered some of his light upon them. It is to this light that one should look for inspiration. In certain circumstances, it springs up from the depths of divine goodness. We must be on the lookout for it, according to the saying of Muhammad, peace be upon him. It happens that your Lord sends messages of grace on certain days of your life. Be ready for these messages. To sum up, know that in the quest for truth, one must strive for perfection, even to the point of seeking the unseekable. Primary truths have no need of being sought because they are present in the mind. What is present will disappear if you seek it, but one who seeks the unseekable will not be suspected of negligence in seeking what can be sought. And so this is what he's telling us. We have to be looking for this kind of certainty, so much certainty that it goes beyond anything the senses or reason can give us. And so this eventually leads them to turn away from the senses and reason and turn to mystical revelation. Um, and contemporary philosophers 
will accept some of these ideas that we want a certain kind of certainty when we're looking for knowledge. But the question is exactly what is that certainty consistent and whether or not we agree with the conclusions that he reaches, we can think these are useful ways of formulating the questions so that we can at least think about the assumptions he's made and determine to what extent do we agree with them, to what extent do we not, and where does it lead us if we do.